Welcome back. Let's Get Physical Therapy is an educational podcast brought to you by MedStar Health and hosted by me, physical therapist Becca Schumer. I will be sharing the mic with tons of healthcare professionals with the goal of educating and inspiring fellow PTs and future PTs. We hope you find this both informative and inspirational, ultimately optimizing how we treat our patients and grow as professionals. Please enjoy today's episode. We're lucky to have physical therapist Tom Sutton on our podcast today. He's a regional director for MedStar Health PT. He's got his DPT and also his PhD. This bio does not do him justice, but we'll hear from him soon to tell us a little more about his story. But he graduated from the University of South Carolina with a clinical doctor in biomechanics and physical therapy. He has his CSCS and enjoys treating the overhead athlete, runners, golfers, sports medicine and performance enhancement restoration. We are going to hop into the lower quarter for the baseball player today, talking about hitting mechanics, common injuries that baseball players endure, and how to get them back to the field playing as best to their ability. With all that said, let's jump into it. Tom Sutton, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Becca. Thanks for having me on today. It's a pleasure to join you and kind of give us material about baseball hitting. Yeah, we've, we've got a few episodes on baseball medicine. I'm excited to jump into the lower quarter with you. But first, I want to hear about your physical therapy story. How did you get into PT? Yeah, so, uh, so you, you know, years ago, um, uh, so I played, played ball at Virginia Tech. Uh, that actually kind of helped me to get into physical therapy. Uh, the guys on the team, I was pre-med at the time, didn't even know what physical therapy was. And the guys on the team would ask me questions that I had no idea <laughs> what they're talking about. Uh, so, uh, but I still thought I would go the medicine route. So I went and uh, was pre-med, took the MCAT, did really, really well on it, got into four medical schools. And then I spent a summer with a physical therapist, a uh, really great guy, uh, and that changed my career forever. I knew I, I would enjoy being a physical therapist. I uh, didn't know if I'd enjoy being a doctor of medicine, so I became a doctor of PT instead. Uh, and a PhD in biomechanics. Um, and so that's been a real blessing in my career. Uh, but that really was, was my fork in the road. Love working with the overhead athletes. Um, also look, love working with the hitters uh, from being from golfers all the way up to baseball players and really kind of breaking their biomechanics down phase by phase and then improving their ability to contact the ball. Uh, and that's been a love of mine for a long time. Probably being a baseball player myself, uh, but all really just, you know, really enjoy, thoroughly enjoying the visual visuality of mechanics of throwing and hitting, which I know we're going to talk about today. Uh, looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, it's just been a big, uh, it's been about 30 years. So it's been a big pleasure in my career being a physical therapist. And I love going to work every each day uh, just to help our athletes uh, get back to sport, whether they're, you know, new and comer uh, kid baseball players. Uh, to some even 85, 90 year old uh, softball players, I've been able to help uh, through the spectrum of life, and it's been a real privilege. I can hear the passion in your voice, and I'm excited to get into this with you. But I do have one question first: Which baseball player holds water? Holds water. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what position? The one is hydrated. That's such a PT answer. It is right. <laughs> The, the pitcher, the pitcher holds the water. The pitcher, oh, I should have got that. Not the catcher, right? Not the catcher. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. Uh, I might awesome. use it for my team meeting tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's dive into, let's go with hitting first. Can we talk a little bit about the big three phases of hitting? Yeah, the, the biggest uh, three phases of hitting are, you know, we have the prep phase and then, and there's a lot of, if you do any research, you'll see there's like five to seven phases of hitting uh, as people kind of break it down, you know, phase by phase by phase. But really you have the prep phase, your stance phase, your stride um, in the, in the drive phase, which is also kind of those two phases together, really the launch phase. And then you have that acceleration phase and the follow through phase. What's interesting for me is I really look at the loading phase of hitting and contact point and the follow through. So try to keep it simple uh, for the coaches and parents, because those three phases really are the biggest, uh, you know, bang for your buck. And, and so they're easier for people to kind of swallow versus get into all the mechanics of every little phase and try to correct those maybe inefficiencies or uh, not as good of a movement 
part. So I look at it from, um, you know, typically from the back view and the side view, uh, and that gives me a lot of good information. So let's kind of talk about a little bit about kind of the, the loading phase or the stance phase. Uh, the loading phase is really where you, you know you get your back pressure over your your rear foot. You know that's going to set up every other phase, and, and it goes into it bleeds into the launch phase of hitting. Uh, the launch phase is really critical because it does set up every other phase for hitting uh, the contact to the follow through. So the launching phase takes us from the end of the loading phase to the contact point of the ball and really kind of consists of five noticeable movements. So one of those movements is the continuation of the timing step. And then you have the opening of the hips. So you want to see opening of the hips during that phase back and side view. And then, you know, that's followed by the forward rotation of the spine. And then there's a pushing. It's interesting. There's actually a pushing, pulling impact of the bat. So people don't realize that when you're swinging a baseball bat and your arms are fully extended, you're actually pushing with your, I'm a right-handed. So my top right hand, we're pushing. My bottom hand is actually pulling through. So there's actually this kind of centrifugal or circular force that is actually going with the bat. And that generates a lot of speed, but also a lot of rotational velocity uh, for the action of the arms and shoulders. And then, of course, the guiding acts of the hands on the bat to the ball. And so those things are really critical for looking at. When you look at side view, one of the things I look at is when they contact the ball. It's one moment in time, and there's a point where the you can see is the athlete fully extending their arms? Uh, do they have their hip in line with, the, uh, with their hands? Does the hip precede the hands? Do the hand precede the hips? And that gives a lot of good information for me as a movement specialist about what is really generating the force. Is, are the hips really kind of rotating and that, that force is transferred to the bat? Or is it really upper body rotation? You know, uh, that actually helps me a ton. Then from the back view, which you'll see in the contact phase of hitting, is you'll see a lot of, you'll see the hip drop, contralateral hip drop, which tells me their, their hips are actually weak and probably um, along, along the same lines of hip weakness is muscle shortening. So the muscle cell called the sarcomere doesn't like to be weak, right? So it's adaptive and it'll be shorter to be stronger. Well, what happens is people lose flexibility. So a lot of times during that contact phase, you can gather a lot of good information. Is the athlete weak? which goes along, are they tight? Uh, you start seeing the, um, instead of seeing arms extended, you'll see more of the uh, elbow drop uh, to the bat, which means they're really not generating a lot of power and speed uh, through the course of the bat or the hitting phase. Uh, and then do they keep their eyes on the ball? You know, one of the questions I love to ask, ask the uh, parents is, can they physically do what you're asking them to do, right? If they keep their eyes, can they contact face? Do they keep their eyes on the ball? So we say keep your eyes on the ball, but then you see the shoulder kind of push the, the jaw away from the ball. So a lot of times they might have this kind of shoulder weakness as well, and that's causing kind of this uh, upper trap substitution, uh, posterior capsule restriction, which is back of the shoulder, and it pushes the face away from off the ball. And you'll see that commonly. So one of the things is we want to do is make sure we understand why does the athlete move the way they do and baseball hitting. A lot of great information there. I have a couple questions for you. First, how are you, are you videotaping these athletes? How are you watching their form? Yeah, I love videotaping. I've been doing it, gosh, since uh, probably early 2000s. Uh, we actually had the old school, before the iPhone, we had a, a, a tape recorder, uh, you know, camcorder, and that was high end at the time. And really kind of setting up to look at back view hitting and then side view hitting. And then we would be able to scroll through the different phases of that to see where the athlete is. Now it's great. We can use a parent's phone, the athlete's phone uh, to scroll to gather information. We do, I do like to look at it uh, directly from the side so that I angle my lens where the, the ball is contact, have a full body or scope of the athlete. And then I also do the same thing with back view where I'm lined up to where the ball contact is. So I don't give an aberration of visual data and I can actually see, are they open up too early? Is their hip kind of coming through uh, the phase or zones, if you will? And then are the, is their arm really extended when they hit the ball? That's pretty important information uh, because it tells me where they are. But then I start to ask the question, peeling back the laters of the onion and say, why do they move that way? And that generates a hypothesis for me. So when I go and check, you know, are they short? Are they weak? Then I can get good information back to the coaches.
That's a, another question that I was thinking about asking you regarding, I, st I talked to Steve Luca and he talked all about the importance of the screen. So obviously in PT, sometimes, unfortunately, we don't get them until they're injured, but I know you do a lot of screening before athletes get hurt. Are you analyzing their baseball movement first and then taking them to the table? Are you doing the table first? Does it depend? What's your systematic approach to that? Yeah, uh, good question. So one of the things that I like to do, I always ask the athlete, do they, or the first of all, when they come in to see me, are they actually have active pain? So if I know the hitting is going to make them worse, we don't want to bleed into that. We don't want to cause more pain. That's not the goal, right? And so what we do is see, do you have any videos of you hitting the ball maybe this year? And a lot of parents now, everybody have an iPhone, uh, coaches, parents, the athletes themselves, they have some material I can look at and I can slow it down phase by phase. The hardest point is, that they won't typically have the same kind of uh, back and side view angle as I will have. They usually, I see a lot of a blink angles because when you're taking a videotape uh, from the stands, usually it's kind of a, uh, it's not side or back. It's usually a front view, which is really hard and it obscures the lens, uh, which doesn't make it easy for me to actually see the athlete. But I can get a lot of good information uh, still. But I do make the decision, if they don't have any pain, but they may have been struggles or they've had previous history of pain uh, and it just seems to be nagging them. I do have them swing uh, the bat, uh, usually off the tee stand uh, or even do a soft toss with them. And we can videotape that side view and then the back view uh, from the assistants who work with me. Then once I generate that hypothesis of what's happening with them to hug contact the ball, I'll lay them down. I have to go through uh, kind of Luca's uh, really, uh, it's a really comprehensive screen for to see what is short, what is weak, what is typically not generating enough force. And typically what I see is, is something is moving way too much because something else is not moving at all. We see the same thing in throwing. So hitting and throwing, uh, whatever impairments, biomechanical impairments you'll see in one, you'll usually see translate into the other. That's a good segue into what are some common injuries you see in the lower extremity baseball athlete. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, upper upper body first, and then we'll kind of go to the kind of go down to the spine, the lower extremity. So one of the common injury injuries we see is is called batter shoulder. Batter shoulder is usually on their non dominant arm, and it, what happens is as they're swinging through from contact phase of the ball. And then as they're releasing a follow through, they overextend the shoulder. And so what happens is there's a portion of the shoulder, posterior inferior portion of that, of that uh, complex that gets actually strained and, I can, and actually can dislocate. I've actually had a few of the uh, uh, baseball players have that happen to them where they overswung the bat, uh, you know, or they miss an outside pitch and they had developed this kind of uh, subluxation and then, of course, uh, uh, spontaneous reduction. Uh, but the labrum is impacted. Uh, we do see that, especially as the athletes are hitting 200, 400 balls per given session, you know, three to four times a week. That's a lot of volume of hitting, uh, and we do see that impact. So one of the remedies is really to look at, you know, just like we do in the throwing athlete, is really look at their scapula, look at their shoulder girdle, make sure it has good congruency or approximation to the joint, and then look, do they hit with their arms or the legs? And so we do see that a lot that once I break the, we break that system up, they don't have the batter's shoulder starts to attenuate. And when they do overswing, they can actually keep the ball in the socket. And that causes a lot of kind of irritation or avoids irritation on the labrum. As we kind of go down further into the spine area, typically you'll see things like spinalolisthesis, which is actually um, it's an interarticularis. Uh, the pars is actually a, can be fractured or and it can be uh, uh, sublux forward because what we are seeing out there uh, is that a lot of coaches are asking the athletes to lock up their front leg. So what that does, uh, it's always unintended constants, whatever we do, is it doesn't allow the hips to come through. It becomes almost like a pole vault where it stops or forward progression, and therefore they get a lot of spine rotation. And there, if you think about th you know, 200 to 400 you know, hits every time you go to practice, what happens is it causes this kind of overuse impact on that um, that bony structure, and that can cause a fracture in there or back strain. We do see that a lot, um, you know. So that's one of the common areas. You know, we talk about spinal orthosis is typically attributed to gymnasts or football linemen who might come up to an extended position, but we're also seeing that some of it 
for baseball uh, baseball hitting. Some of that's also because the trunk uh, doesn't have good stability or control. And so if it can't control their movement, you get a lot of rotation force to the spine. And that, again, can cause that kind of fracture or slippage forward. Okay. Um, I can imagine a youngster who doesn't have that coordination and that core control, and they're kind of swinging for the fences and kind of creating that stress reaction in their back as well. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I remember I was never uh, a big power hitter. Ironically, uh, you know, usually your number three is your is your power hitter. And uh, but I could definitely find green out there in the field. And that's one thing that our coach uh, Chuck Hartman would tell me. He said, Tommy, can you just find me some green today? You know, and I was like, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, just trying to get out there to hit, you know, even a single or, or a double if you can make it down the line. Uh, those things are pretty a lot more powerful. And, you know, typically what you'll see is when the, when the athlete is swinging for the fence, Usually either they hit it to the fence or they strike out because they overswing. They don't really have control of the bat. And we see that often, which you want to really want a quality of movement. Um, so speaking of when you go to quality of movement, you know, we talk about the shoulder, we talk about the spine and some of the strains you might see, but we also see knee injuries too. You know, that kind of if you can't rotate through your hips, the hips are great, there's a great structure, very stable, a lot of motion, then you'll move to your knee. And move, when you move to your mean more than 15 degrees, you're probably going to disrupt an ACL or meniscus or both. OK, and so we do see that a lot of times uh, with the baseball hitters is they start to get knee pain. Uh, typically, though, it's actually the LCL, the lateral collateral ligament that we see on their uh, their front leg. OK, so you kind of rotate through. They lock the leg out. And the only saving grace of that ligament is it's extra articular. So it's outside the joint. And so we don't see a lot of meniscal tears uh, from the lead leg, but we'll see the LCO disruption. Uh, they'll complain of fibula hip pain uh, or kind of outside the knee. And then you got to discriminate if it's an IT band or is it actually more of a, uh, a ligamentous type of injury. Uh, but we see we do see that repetition, uh, muscular, uh, musculoskeletal type strains uh, with the knees. Okay. You mentioned 15 degrees, that lacking 15 degrees of hip internal rotation. It's more torsional, uh, so it's more towards the knee rotation. So the knee okay. does rotate some, sure. uh, but it doesn't, if you go more than 15 degrees on a knee, it doesn't do so well. And so yeah. it's not really made to rotate. The hips are made to rotate. And so what we see is hips are, hips are the greatest thing you can have for throwing a ball or hitting a ball. And that's where I really back to train up for the athletes say, hey, how are you moving through your hip girdle? Can you move? Do you have restriction? Are you tight? Are you also weak? And we see that often. So once we restore that hip girdle rotation and the ability to load and unload the joint, uh, the athlete does great. We don't really see them, you know, knee pain resolves, elbow pain resolves. We see a lot of that play out with the athletes. Are you seeing any labral pathologies in the hip with the regards to lacking that rotation in the hip? We do, and that's that because uh, you know the the glutes are are the are the back muscles of the hip, and you know they're, they're being first class levers. They have a, they can impact a lot of force, right? And so they're made to load, they're made to to kind of absorb, but also propel. And so what happens in the labrum is, is typically you'll have this kind of anterior translation, and that causes some of this labral upset or overuse. Versus if the force was more on the posterior side of the hip joint towards the glute, the glutes can hold that in place. They're made to hold, they're made to load. Um, they're actually incredibly powerful uh, uh, muscles. And so we typically always tell athletes, I want you long and strong. I want you long and strong. And so I want you to have good flexibility, but also strength at the end range as much as you do at the beginning range. And so we work a lot well on that with physical therapy. And then what we see on the video analysis after I do uh, pre and then post is we see them move a lot easier, a lot better. They look more, uh, you don't see the efficiencies develop where they start having knee rotation or back rotation or, or you know, overuse of the elbow or shoulder girdles. Can we go back up the chain for a second and, and kind of talk about the importance of a strong core in the baseball player? I know we kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you dive in a little deeper on the importance of that? Yeah, uh, you know, I've always said, you know, the, your your core strength, your your dominus rectus, uh, your transverse dominus was a very deep layer of, of musculature, you know, that works synergistically together with the multifidi. Those are incredibly powerful muscles to stabilize the spine. 
And so having a core of all those muscles that work together, control your movement it is incredibly important. So I usually have the athletes do the ab roller, which they love. I say that LOL. Uh, because the uh, the athletes hate it because usually they're weak at it. And so when I see the athletes come in and we have them do maybe sit-up tests or a plank position, then they kind of hold it. But as soon as you start adding that dynamic nature to the ab roller, uh, then they actually can do like maybe two and at 25%, you know, if they're lucky. And so when we finish with them, you know, they're doing 30 to 40 repetitions in a row with full extension. And so that's the difference between when you lay out for a ball – you know, whether it be in the middle field or on the on the ends, uh, you know, and really kind of you know, have that control. But it also translates to swinging too, and the ability to control that trunk as you rotate your hip girdle through the range of motion. Luke uh, got into the bunkies. Yep. It sounds like you use those as well. We do. Yeah, there's a lot of care between throwing and hitting. You'll see that you're going to see the same deficiencies uh, or the same muscle structures. They, they're you know, used in a different way from hitting and throwing, but they're still there and it's still biomechanics of anatomy. Right. And so uh, bunkies are great uh, when you look at a posterior stabilizing line or medial line uh, to see where the athlete really is. And a lot of the athletes, what's amazing to me is how well they move or hit a ball given how many restrictions they really have. It's, that's the most incredible part. And, and sometimes without an injury for a long time, the bad, the downside of that is there is like a tender box. You know, they're at high risk for having injury because, you know, the muscles are weak or in a shortened position. We want them to begin long and strong. We want the trunk muscles to have that engagement. So no matter what they're doing, they're throwing a ball or hitting a the ball. They have good control through the range of motion incredibly important so they can have this lifelong um, ability to play the sport, you know, beyond college be, and maybe even beyond the pros. And there's a lot of, you know, men and women league out there is that, you know, you want to be an active uh, baseball player or softball player, uh, incredibly important to keep your, uh, your exercise resume up. So you don't become the weekend warrior who's going out full force and then you get injured. That blends nicely into my next question regarding asymmetry throwing batting it's all asymmetric split stance stuff so one side is more dominant obviously the whole body is involved in the movement but how are you addressing these asymmetries be it in season out of season to ensure that one side's not getting too tight one side's not getting too weak finding that balance for the athlete and overall general health of the athlete yeah i think you know we have one of the you know other than being formally trained in physical therapy and, and i was an exercise physiologist before that um, so I learned a lot about strength training, actually from Virginia Tech, uh, a ton about training the uh, performance athlete. And so one of the, we actually had an off season program, then you had an in season program. One of the things I drive home if they're in season, which now is pretty much 12 days, 12, uh, excuse me, months a year. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's a long season. They have fall ball, then they have spring ball, then they have summer ball. So now the 12 months are probably playing ball somewhere. Uh, so one of the things I do look at, you know, is it really educate the athlete, the parents and the coaches that, you know, if you're playing on Saturday, don't do weight training on Friday night, you know, give yourself that time to rest and recover. That's equally important as actually doing the exercise themselves. They can stretch every day, but not strengthening, you know, two times a week of a muscle group is sufficient enough to maintain uh, the muscle strength throughout the season. That's basically what you're trying to do in the off season. Uh, you know, really having a four day week program where you're hitting each muscle group twice a week, uh, lower body and upper bodies is, is critically important as a general guideline. Uh, but you also want days of rest there, too. You want to have, uh, you know, if you do a Monday, Thursday split for upper body, then you know, Tuesday, Friday split for lower body. You have Wednesday off and the weekend off as well, where you can maybe do on some crossover or cross or activity like hitting or throwing and really doing some arm care, you know, hitting care, but arm care, too. Uh, and control that. Also make sure that, you know, when you when you are playing the sport, you always ice afterwards. Even when you don't have injury, we call it milking the joint where you're pushing out fluid and it does help recovery time. Uh, so a lot of my athletes, actually, the first thing they do is they'll go on Amazon or uh, go to one of the local sports stores and, um, you know, order a uh, compression sleeve for the shoulder and the elbow so they can continue to milk that area. And then they report back to me even months later after they've been discharged that, how much that really helped them a ton with the arm care and the recovery time because they weren't staying uh, so swollen or had that kind of residual swelling afterwards. Sports being 12 months, they're not getting a break and 
hopefully they're as kids they're trying multiple positions and not just doing the same thing over and over repetitively to leading them to have more risk of having an overuse injury what's the pulse on baseball these days and kids and pitch counts and and all of that yeah little league has done a pretty good job of making sure that you know pitch counts are controlled they have standards of, of really standards of care but they don't want the athlete to, you know, uh, throw more than, say, 70 times in a week uh, or how many innings they throw. So they do a pretty good job of making sure that uh, the uh, athlete is not overthrowing. Also, you know, I know that probably Steve went into it, but the different pitches that really you really should be working on at different age groups. Um, you know, uh, hitting is hitting is different, but it's about the volume of hitting, you know, having a 12 year old hitting 400 times you know, three times a week, that's a lot, right? And then maybe cut that down to maybe 200 times, three times a week, and then have some rest and recovery time in there. Um, I really focus with the athletes on trying to get them doing functional strengthening exercises that are dynamic or ballistic in nature uh, versus just the machines uh, so they can control their bodies for the range of motion. Uh, and also working on quality, quality of movement, um, you know, really kind of slowing the phases down to make sure they can control each phase of moving uh, as they hit. Uh, so they're not just, you know, um, happenstance hitting the ball. It's more of a controlled behavior. And, and a lot of the athletes, they do uh, come back and say, man, that, you know, I really am working on my quality of a hitting. Uh, because as you get to the higher levels, uh, you know, milliseconds pay off dividends and they have that quality of rotation. Uh, but you have to really practice makes perfect, you know, and I always say that perfect practice makes perfect. Uh, but you got to really kind of work on the quality of your movement. We talked a lot about the musculoskeletal issues. Let's go into equipment issues. What what are some things to be aware of that could be hindering an athlete's ability to fully bat or hit well or power, et cetera? Yeah. So a lot of times we look at, especially for hitting, look at uh, how big their bat is. You know, is it, you know, is it a drop of, you know, tw minus 12, you know? Uh, you know, a lot of, so the first thing I look at, okay, so when you bring it, they bring a bat in, if they had them, I'm sure they have their, first of all, put their cleats on and then they stand with the bat next to their, um, you know, next to their leg. And so if it's, you know, the hip level, that's great. If it's above hip level, it's probably too long for them. Uh, so one of the biggest misconceptions is a lot of MLB players, you know, who they look up to, right. As we're hitting with, you know, 45 ounce bats. You know, that's not true. You know, they're usually like uh, 40, uh, 34, 31 ounce bats uh, at the most. And most of the hitters out there uh, nowadays are not hitting with, you know, uh, you know, lumbers of wood. They're hitting with something that makes sense. They can actually have good speed, good control, uh, good accuracy, and really kind of get to the zone quick. As 95 miles an hour comes very, very fast, right? And so you'll be able to have the catch up speed. Otherwise, you'll be sitting down on the bench. And so that's important for them to have the proper hitting or batting uh, material as they kind of work as they get higher. So there's actually good graphs out there that talk about, you know, if you're this height, you should have, you know, 26 inch. You know, if you're let's say I'm like a 5'11", for example, and it's good based upon how tall you are, but also how much you weigh. So if you're 5'11", say 200 pounds. 34 inch, 31 ounce is actually pretty appropriate for your your size and your weight. Okay, but I do see some of the kids they have their bats are too big for them, so they like the fact that they have a bat. The other thing I always say it's like putting on a pair of shoes. You know when you're you know when you're at the store, you know ask the athlete how does it feel? How does it feel for you? If it doesn't feel right there, it's not going to change later on when you get home. So make sure the bat feels good in your hands as you're push pulling through the zone. Uh, that's important. Uh, it should feel good. It should feel like, man, I can really, I feel like I have control of this bat. The, the bat doesn't have control of me. And that's also leads to a lot of, uh, you know, reduction in injuries too, by having the proper bat size. Luca got into, you know, weighted balls. Is there anything to training with a heavier bat? Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of times they warm up. So the athletes will typically have a heavier bat or like a fungo bat. Uh, so it's a little bit more solid, uh, you know, as they warm up, but as they're hitting the ball, Use the device you're actually going to hit it with. You know, batting is a little different uh, than, say, uh, you know, with throwing. And so all of the rotational things we do for the strength training uh, really should translate over to uh, hitting with the bat. So hitting with the weighted bat, does it help? Uh, it definitely slows down your speed. It slows down your ability to contact the ball. Uh, so always the athletes that do well uh, that I've noticed 
have the proper bat, have the proper speed. They're used to it. It's just like putting a glove on. They know the difference between that bat and somebody else's bat. It feels totally different to them. Uh, but having those ratios is pretty important as they develop as an athlete from the 12-year-old all the way up to the 23, 24-year-old um, having that. I, I do have some trivia, you know, that uh, talking about some of the, um, you know, some of the athletes out there. I mean, like Aaron Judd's a big guy for the, you know, the Yankees, right? You know, and, and as we were like, what kind of bat does he use? Is it 40, 40 inch, you know, a 30, 36 ounce? Like, no, it's actually a 35 inch, 33 ounce. That, and that's actually, that's a big bat too, right? Um, you know, back in the in the good old days, you know, guys like uh, Babe Ruth, uh, they might have had a bat that was uh, a little, uh, quite a bit bigger actually uh, than that than that time. So uh, Hank Aaron, I mean, they use, uh, he is actually had a pretty big bat during his time period, it was like 35 inches long and 33, the same as Aaron Judd, right? And so, but King Griffey Jr., you look at kind of guys like that, he had a 34 uh, inch bat. So, so less, the control of the bat is really important uh, for the athlete. And like I said, I tell the athlete, if you don't like it when you're at the store, it's just like putting a, a nice pair of shoes on. You're not going to like it when you get home. Uh, you don't want to have, you know, a lumber that's like a Babe Ruth number of 36 inches, you know, 38 ounce. That's a, that is like a log to, to swing. Uh, and it's amazing he, <laughs> how he was able to swing that uh, by his, at, you know, during this time period. Uh, but I think that that's important for the athletes. It's been great. You've kind of given a nice intro into hitting mechanics. And I know you could talk all day long about that. I can hear the passion in your voice about it. But starting to wrap up here a little bit for a uh, Physical therapists looking to treat baseball players, where would it, uh, someone start? What's a good place to kind of jump into this area? Definitely, you know, watch them on the video. I will look at, you know, even my residents, I have them look uh, at the athlete uh, on video, side view and back view. Uh, watch them actually move. We're movement specialists. Uh, we're very visual. Uh, you can see, get a lot of good information from watching them at every phase of, of hitting. You know, are, is there things to simply ask, is the arm extended? Do you see the hip align with the hands when they contact the ball or vice versa? Do you see the drop of the pelvis just like you would in running? So from the back view. So those couple, just, just those areas tell you a lot where the athlete is. Do you see the, the uh, shoulder hike up, you know, as they kind of contact the ball and they lose their window? You don't see a window between the ear and the shoulder. It kind of closes. That's important. That tells you that they might have posterior capsule tightness. So you develop this hypothesis and then you go check that you cross check yourself to say you know well maybe it's a hypothesis but is it true is it true for that athlete and that that's what your start point is and then the other question you ask is why are they moving the way they move because that's the only way they can move at the time but then when you peel back those layers and restore their motion they will move differently they will move naturally differently to hit a ball or to throw a ball and that's the, that's the proof in the pudding is really can I get them from this position where they're dysfunctional to this position where they're efficient and effective? And obviously it's getting the reps in as well, right? And, and understanding what normal looks like from righty, lefty, all the different angles. Yeah, and showing them, showing them, having that kind of that, that visual feedback to the athlete. See, do you see here? Let's focus on that a little bit. Let's focus on, you know, rotating through the ball, extending your arms, maybe back off the plate just a little bit, right? Because those, those little, little tweaks you do here and there, uh, they do uh, make an impact for um, uh, for control and for biomechanics. I always, you know, like to say, and I said it earlier, perfect practice makes perfect. When I was at SC, one of the greatest things I, I love about working with the baseball and football teams uh, was it was it was like a, just like a game. Uh, it was perfect practice makes perfect, and you really were dialed into that, where you know you're really working on your quality of movement. Uh, and, and really making sure you're fine-tuning whatever movement it is that you want to actually have on the field. Is there anything we didn't cover that you're itching to talk about for PT for the baseball athlete? Yeah, you know, it's just it's just fun being a physical therapist. It, I'm so it's great. My my fork in my road I talked about early in this conversation. I was a true fork because I just didn't know. Uh, but it's been a great journey. I've been doing it a long time. I've seen you know tons and tons of athletes come through. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to help most of them uh, do well, uh, you know, and the repeat offenders, they usually come back and see me for something else that, you know, maybe traumatically happened. Uh, but it's been great to kind of get them, keep them on the field and get them back to the field. Uh, I say, you know, whatever you do for free, uh, that's what you do for your life. 
uh, you know, and for me, it's it's just being a PT. I'll, I'll probably end up retiring uh, whenever that's going to be eventually uh, to become a be a physical therapist and do it for free if I can. So uh, it's just fun to get out there to restore motion, to help the athletes, to kind of pay it for uh, what they've been, what you can, all the knowledge we've been given as physical therapists, to just to kind of transfer that to our patients. I appreciate your expertise in this topic. It's something I don't know a ton about. I don't treat a lot of baseball players. So I myself have learned a ton just in talking to you today. Kind of wrapping up again, I know you already shared your your favorite quote with us, but can you dive in a little bit more about your favorite quote and why? Yeah, I just think that, uh, you know, I used to, I, when I was uh, an athlete myself, and I, was, I heard practice makes perfect practice. And you hear that a lot, right? But perfect practice is what really makes perfect. It really put the intentional effort in to making sure whatever movement it is or hitting the ball that you're really working on, you know, hitting off a, off a T-stand. That When I went to Tech in the first practice and we hit off a T-stand, I was just blown away. Like, I hadn't had a T-stand since I was on the T-ball. You know, this is years ago. And, and it, was, it was actually one of the best things I could have done was hit off a T-stand. It helped me work on my mechanics to slow it all down to build back up. And, and then so when I had an inside pitch or, or outside pitch, I could really – um, you know, rotate through the ball and, and to get some good lift on it and drive it to find some green out there in the field. And I would encourage any athlete, work on the quality of motion. Work on those two, make sure those 200 hits, make sure they count. Just don't go and swing, but really work on the quality of the motion of them. Be intentional about uh, you as an athlete. If you love the game that much, you know, and you're having fun with it, just work on your quality. You'll get better and better and better, much better than you ever thought you'd probably give yourself credit for. Great, great words of advice. Tom, it's been a pleasure having you today. Where can people find you? So uh, everywhere. <laughs> so I practice at Germantown is one of our offices. It's a 20,500 Seneca uh, Parkway uh, in, in Germantown. And then we also have our baseball softball uh, facility in Gaithersburg. That's the 8777 Stupor School Road. Uh, that's in uh, Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland, and uh, they can also contact our office, and uh, we have a great admin team, uh, 301-916-8500. That's our flagship office in Germantown, but it really helps control uh, and navigate both offices at Germantown and Gaithersburg, which, by the way, are very close to each other, about 5.3 miles away from one another. Uh, so we love to see patients at both offices and who have a, what a wonderful team uh, that I support. Uh, and they're just incredible with uh, their knowledge base and the love they have for treating our patients and get them back to the field and keep them on the field. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Becca. I really appreciate it. It's been great talking with you and kind of sharing some of this love we both have for the sports. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Let's Get Physical Therapy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram at PT. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so we can reach more listeners just like you. As always, we appreciate your time and hope you join us for our next episode.